After a long time with pretty much nothing, it's finally time for me to make a video. <laughs> yeah, you, you thought I was going to say it's time for the graphic novel, didn't you? Well, that too, but I would like to apologize for my lack of videos. You'd think that my summer break would be the time for me to be working on videos, but I got stuck working on a short story my best friends forced me to write, hanging out with friends a lot, and I got really attached to How I Met Your Mother. But now that I've finished the story and am extremely angry at the way How I Met Your Mother ended, it's finally time for me to get back to working on videos, which hopefully my senior year of high school won't stop me from doing, but it probably will. Regardless, the final Fast Five Frights graphic novel is now out. You guys know the deal. In this video, we'll be talking about everything I noticed in the Fast Frights graphic novel volume 5. I'll talk about differences from the original stories, weird or good choices in the art, any possible but unlikely lore, and everything else I think there is to discuss. So without further ado, let's get started. Number 1. The first story in this book is Jump for Tickets, which was illustrated by Diana Camaro. If you don't recognize that name, she's the one who illustrated the fourth closet graphic novel, Hide and Seek, and The Breaking Wheel, which are inarguably the best graphic novel stories. So it isn't surprising that Jump for Tickets is the best story in this graphic novel, visually speaking. The main thing that's cool about this art is just how clean and also detailed it is, and the characters are designed to perfection. Shadow Bonnie in Hide and Seek was incredible looking, Julius was very gruesome, and Coiled the Clown looks exactly as he should, which is to say, he looks very cool. Number 2. One thing I noticed is that in the background of the story, we can see Colton has a few pieces of Fazbear merch. He has a figure of Freddy Fazbear as well as Chica's Cupcake. What's weird about this though is that Colton in the story doesn't actually like Freddy's. He likes the games that are there, but it is stated in the story that he knows he is too old for Freddy's and doesn't care at all about the Fazbear characters. He exclusively likes the arcade games. So why would he have Fazbear merch? It doesn't really make that much sense. Number 3. One thing I noticed is that when Colton goes to Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, we can see the sign logo for it on the building. It might just be the lighting, but Freddy looks really desaturated here, and his bow tie seems to be colored purple, more akin to Fredbear. Later on in the story, we actually see Freddy himself, and the bow tie still looks purple there as well. I don't think this is a crazy lore detail or anything, it's just something I noticed. Number 4. The prize counter in the story shows off a bunch of different things, most notably the game station that is the motivation for the story. However, there's a couple other things here that are a bit interesting to me. For example, there's a green security breach phaser blaster. There's also a doll that looks familiar to me, but I'm not sure if it's because of FNAF or just real life, but just wanted to point it out. There's also a doll of Chica that has pink cheeks and three toes on each foot, indicating it's meant to be toy Chica, not normal Chica. Number 5. Coils in this book is almost 100% accurate to how he is shown in the art from the Ultimate Guide. The white gloves with three fingers, the yellow coils, lemon and lime stripes on the body and the hat, the red afro, blue cheeks, and everything else is exactly the same. The only slight difference is the eyebrows. But one thing I noticed is that in this book, he actually strikes the exact same pose that he does in that art from the character Encyclopedia, which I think is pretty cool. Number 6. In the original Jump for Tickets, when Colton escapes out the window, a couple tools fall out of his pocket when he gets out. However, in the graphic novel, the tools fall out on the inside of the bathroom, not the outside. The graphic novel also has Colton acknowledge that he felt something else was in there with him, but that there wasn't and his mind was just playing tricks on him. This is strange because throughout the entire scene, there was never any indication that he thought someone else was in the building with him. Number 7. The original Jump for Tickets names a couple arcade games that Freddy's has that Colton would play to get a bunch of tickets, those being BB's Ball Drop and Dee Dee's Fishing Hole. This isn't a huge mistake or anything, but the graphic novel shows us the Dee Dee arcade game and gets the name slightly wrong, having a hyphen in the name Dee Dee despite there not being a hyphen or space in the original story, and it also says Dee Dee's Fishing Game instead of Fishing Hole. Number 8. The the original story has Colton see coils in front of the ticket pulverizer and wave his hands in front of the eyes, finding them to not react. Then he tries to open up the hatch into the lower part of the machine, and coils put his hand on Colton's shoulder, causing Colton to whirl around and knock the clown over. The graphic novel does both these things, but instead, he knocks over coils first, and then waves his hands in front of coils' eyes. And he comes to the conclusion that coils wasn't moving at all and was turned off, which doesn't make sense because coils literally just put his hand on Colton's shoulder. There's a couple other weird things I noticed in the final sequence like how Coils literally locked Colton under the ticket pulverizer, which in the original story he doesn't. This is a bit weird because I always thought it was implied Coils was actually trying to help Colton, trying to get him out the whole time and trying to save him. Instead, it seemed like there was just no way to open the hatch from the inside. 
I'm not claiming this as an error or anything, I just thought that Coils was the good guy. Regardless, the original story mentions how Colton was worried he would run out of air if he stayed under the machine the whole night, but in the graphic novel, it's literally just a vent, meaning air still comes through it. This also makes it make no sense why nobody hears him at the end of the story, as he could literally just bang on the vent grate and it would rattle and he would be easily noticed. Not to mention, people would probably just see him in there through the holes in the vent grate. There's also no mention of Colton's phone ringing and Coils picking it up, which does happen in the original story. Number 9. The second story in the book is Sea Bonnies, one of the weirdest stories in the entire series and the story from this book that I was most curious about seeing in graphic novel form. I was too lazy to check, but based on the style, I think it's the same artist that worked on The New Kid, especially based on the way the animatronics look. The art is cool, nothing too special, at least compared to the first story, but still pretty good. Regardless, there's a point in the story where the sea bonnies hatch from their eggs, and when they do, Ma can see that there's actually hundreds of them now swimming around in clusters throughout the fish tank. However, the graphic novel shows the fish tank, and it's very clear that there's not nearly hundreds in there, and the sea bonnies are shown to be way bigger than the original story implies them to be. Number 10. On this page here, Mott's backpack and shoes as well as a staircase just pop up out of absolutely nowhere without a time skip of any measure. That's all. Number 11. When Mott swallows the sea bonnies after drinking water from the sink in the middle of the night, he worries that he had just drunk a bunch of sea bonnies. Then a couple pages later, the sea bonnies claim that he had only swallowed one. Not anything huge, but it's just a bit weird. Number 12. The end of sea bonnies claims that Mott has a bluish tint to his skin and that his skin was pale and almost see-through. The graphic novel takes this just a little bit too far though. Instead of him being pale with a blue tint, he is literally made of blue sludge, which is obviously not accurate. Number 13. The final story in the graphic novel is also the final story of Fazbear Frights, not including Felix the Shark, Fine Player 2. Emmett Tucker in this graphic novel is designed very creepily, but he's actually a bit inaccurate in a few ways to the original story. Tucker in the original is described as having really dark, almost black eyes, as well as yellowed and crooked teeth. In the graphic novel, he has light blue eyes, and his teeth are a bit yellow, but not crooked, and he's also missing a tooth for some reason, which I'm pretty sure is never said in the story. It does do a good job of making him look creepy, though. Number 14. At one point in the graphic novel, we get what is essentially a zoom out of the layout of Freddy's. What's weird though is that you can see Freddy, Bonnie, and Chica on stage, and Foxy's not there. Instead, there's just a random second Freddy animatronic on his own stage, which is really weird. Number 15. You're gonna do a superhero landing. Wait for it! Woo! Superhero landing! Number 16. In the original Fine Player 2, the woman who greets Amy at Flo's Fabulous Eatery is wearing a ridiculous looking black and white cow costume. In the graphic novel, she is not, instead just sporting a fairly typical apron. And that's everything I noticed in the Fast by Frights graphic novel Volume 5. Tales from the Pizzaplex is also going to be getting graphic novels starting next year, so I'll of course be covering that, and I will also be covering the week before, the interactive novel, though that video might take a bit longer to come out since it's a pretty long book to get through. But it shouldn't be too far from now, maybe like a week or so. But anyways guys, I hope you all enjoyed this video, if you did make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you want to, and I will see you all in the next video. Bye guys!